How's everybody doing? My name is Jonathan. This is Comic Book Cinema. And today I am joined by three wonderful guests. Mr. Jared Mayo, would you like to start off with the introductions? What's up? I'm Jared. I run the M6P.com. You can check us out on Facebook and pretty much the inspiration for Jonathan even doing this at all. So uh, I'm humbled that he brought me on his show. <laughs> I was about to say, stay humble, Jared. Stay humble. <laughs> but hey, next time I want you to, when you do the intro, I want you to whip your ponytail around and then do a pet jump, like boop, 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 boop. Uh -huh, like that? <laughs> yeah. Perfect. <laughs> What's up, Luke? Yeah, hello. I'm a uh, Lurk Vineyard. I'm a professional garbage maker, and I'm here to talk about Spider-Man uh, and all superhero information. Perfect. <laughs> <laughs> My wife is, is Eklund. <laughs> and uh, Mr. Grant Watley, what's up, brother? How you doing? What's up, man? I'm uh, just a just a regular gamer slash YouTuber slash Movie watcher, Grantley 16, YouTube. <laughs> Grant oozes DC, Jared. He just oozes it through his veins. <laughs> <laughs> we meet again. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so today we are going to review, with spoilers, the new Spider-Man movie, Spider-Man No Way Home. we really have to talk about is Andrew and Toby. I think we all saw that coming, right? I mean, that was something that, you know, it never was confirmed by the studio, but uh, there was a lot of speculation as to, will they be in it? Will they not be in it? They were in it. I love, <laughs> I loved seeing Toby again. I thought that was the coolest thing ever, ever. He looked a lot older, noticeably. I loved how they were in the movie, and there was a lot of cool things that they were that they did in the film. I wasn't a fan of how Andrew was brought in. Like, you know, it was kind of funny, and I get it. You know, the uh, Ned opened up the the portal with Doctor Strange's sling ring, but I don't know. That whole like moment just seemed like kind of awkward to me, or like just kind of maybe I'm being too nitpicky about this, but. I mean, overall, don't get me wrong. I thought they did the movie. The movie as a whole was phenomenal. I loved it. But just that initial scene for me was kind of awkward. What did you guys think? You mean when, like, he opens the portal and it's kind of questionable which Spider-Man is in the distance? Yeah. Like when Andrew shows up on you, – you thought that was cheesy? Oh, not cheesy. No, I just thought it was kind of, like, awkward. I don't know, like, my ex – It was so awkward. I think it was so awkward because they kind of just jumped through this random ring that they, you know, never seen anything like that before. And they didn't make much comment about it. They were just like, okay, I jumped through a magic ring and it worked all right now. You know? <laughs> but that's like all of Dr. Strange. That's what he does. Literally. Yeah. That, I thought it was the perfect segue. It's like the only way to kind of make sense of transitioning the multiverse. It was pretty much, they should have went into more detail on like our, you would think that Toby and Andrew would both be like, how did that happen? You know, or something, but they're just, they stepped through it and they're like, all right, I'm here. <laughs> you know, yeah. they, they didn't give them a further explanation to me. I'm not complaining. I just thought it was kind of the way it was done was just a little awkward, but I mean, still yeah. it was, I loved it. What'd you think, Mr. Jared? I know you was excited about it. Well, he was, uh, so the both to uh, Andrew and Toby were already in the MCU, right? They were just somewhere else. So when he opened up the ring, they came from whatever alley or whatever. So I think they probably were already like, this is a weird day already. It uh, just makes sense. I should jump through this. Someone is, is calling for me and I know I'm Spider-Man, so I'm just going to go for it. So I didn't really think too much of it. I more so thought... It's like when I first saw Andrew, I was just you know, with the rest of the, the theater, you know, screaming at the top of my lungs, like, ah, that's so great. But for some reason, I thought Toby might just not be in it. I thought it was just going to be Andrew. And that was kind of like how they were teasing us. Like, we're going to bring in his, uh, you know, Toby's villains. But Toby, he's just, we're not doing an old man Spider-Man story where he's just not going to be in it. So when Toby showed up, 
that's kind of when I was like, picked my seat up and I threw it up and at the person in front of me. And then I was like, Oh my gosh. Yeah. It was definitely surreal to see these guys in that, in the MCU, you know, because I don't know, it was, it was really cool. Don't get me wrong. Really cool. What did you guys think overall about the villains? Did you, did you think that, that there was too many villains or did you think that Marvel found a way to make it work? What do you think? I thought that uh, they did a really good job with uh, the villains. I thought William Defoe especially oh. was, uh, did an amazing job. Uh, I, he, he portrayed it just how he would have back then. You know, I thought it was, he did a really good job. Even for being better. Like he took it up a notch. He, he yeah. definitely like stepped his game up big time. And he, and, and being, you know, 68 or 69, I forget how old he is, but he uh, even asked to do his own stunts he didn't want any CGI to make him look younger. I think he did a great job. He doesn't uh, need any CGI. The guy is yeah. an ageless wonder. Like, he hasn't changed at all <laughs> in 20 years, which is nuts. Yeah. I think Green Goblin was perfect. It, like, how, how, how could anybody else ever play that role? Kind of like Jack Nicholson and Joker. Nobody else can ever play that role. So, to see uh, – to see <laughs> that's a preview for another episode. But, man, Green Goblin, like, the others just – they paled, unfortunately, you know, I, I even Alfred Molina, who I thought just destroyed Dr. Octopus in uh, Spider-Man 2. He was he was overshadowed by William Defoe. You can't there. This the screen is only so big. And when William Defoe shows up, you've got to work your butt off to be able to to maintain your presence on the on the screen with him. I thought he was perfect. You know, Sandman and Lizard, they are what they are. Uh, I w- it was cool to see them. Uh, but they didn't, you know, add nor take away anything from, I think, the story. Jamie Foxx, for me, was probably the a little bit of a letdown for me. I know there was that throwaway line about how did you get your hair back and yada, 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 but they didn't explain it. They were just like, oh, how'd you do that? Well, don't worry about it. Jamie Foxx just didn't want to be bald for this movie. So we made <laughs> him look cool and gave him a bad attitude. Like, eh, I didn't really care for that, though. I, I think that Alfred Molina shined a lot, actually. Like, William Defoe. don't get me wrong, he stole the show, like you said. I mean, that turn at the end of the movie, when you think that this guy is working with Spider-Man and he's trying to help these guys get back to where they belong and blah, blah, blah. But when he has that massive turn at the end, man, and he, and he flips that switch, oh, he did such a great job. I almost want to say... William Defoe as Green Goblin in this movie is my favorite MCU villain performance, maybe possibly of all time. I don't want to get too excited just yet. I need to, I need to see the movie again. And I need to let some time go by, but it's definitely up there, man. Like it's, it's up there. He did a great job. And speaking of villains, uh, did you, did you see the, the after credit scene where Eddie Brock was zapped to another universe and uh some yeah. of the venom symbiote was left over so they're they're obviously planning on making a, a new venom there was an after credit scene <laughs> jared oh man i wondered why i was the only one that left you're well, such a cut up thrown, jared i had thrown my chair when i saw tope so they actually escorted me out but yeah man <laughs> now i'm glad you brought that up because honestly i thought i was a little bit let down by that I really wanted to see Venom in some capacity in the movie. It would have been really cool to see Tom Hardy play off of Tom Holland. But for whatever reason, they didn't do that, I guess, because they felt like it was already super crowded. And Venom's kind of more of an anti-hero as opposed to being a straight-up villain. Yeah, I guess that leaves the door of possibility open for, you know, having our or the MCU's version of Venom, possibly, because there's a, a trace of that symbiote left behind. And if you guys have seen the Venom movies, which are hit or miss, for lack of a better term, or to be very (laughs) optimistic about it, the Venom, the way they describe his knowledge and his understanding and things like that, he's like a hive mind that's connected to all of his different versions in the multiverse, giving him that knowledge. So maybe when that symbiote gets left behind and it attaches to the Eddie Brock of the MCU universe, it's all connected. I don't know, but I, I was just, I thought that was kind of pointless to, to tease it at the end of the Venom movie. And then he's not in the whole entire Spider-Man movie. And then there's another teaser at the end of this movie. It didn't make sense to me. Like if you're going to tease it, put him in the film, at least for a little bit, you know, but that's my thoughts on it. I was a little let down by that. 
And I thought it was pretty neat too. A lot of people have talked about the Venom symbiote being multiversal. So in several universes have the same hive mind. So you notice that Venom was the one that recognized who uh, Spider-Man was, whereas Eddie Brock didn't. So I thought that was kind of neat. We need to see Venom bond or that symbiote bond to Spider-Man and get the black suit. We need to see that. Mm -hmm. Luke, I know you're a part of our uh, Venom review, Venom Part 2, Let There Be Carnage. I thought that this was kind of like a layup, like they're going to do, they're going to introduce the characters later on. I guess I'm not knowledgeable enough about the uh, the overall universe, but I, I thought this was kind of like a, a foreshadowing uh, that they were going to bring them together later. So if this means like that's as close as they're going to interact, I'm kind of pissed because then it kind of makes the whole Venom movie thing like completely useless. It's totally uh, money bag because the... Uh, we, we've talked about the Venom movies ex- extensively. I, I don't, I don't, I've laid them to rest. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's definitely interesting that they didn't, you know, I guess they're still saving that moment for whenever it finally happens in a Sony film. I don't know. And also the future of Spider-Man is still a little uncertain at this point. I don't know if Sony and uh, Disney have re-upped their deal to continue making movies together. I think there's only one more film that's confirmed for sure. What did you guys think about the ending as far as, you know, him making the ultimate sacrifice? Personally, I really saw this as such a wonderful trilogy, okay? I wasn't super big on the first two, Homecoming and Far From Home, but the way they brought everything together and it was almost like the tale of Spider-Man transitioning from boy to man in this, you know, he had a lot of stuff to deal with. Aunt May, I really didn't see that coming. I I mean, I was kind of shocked. It's cool. You know, it doesn't have to be super loyal to the comics now because we have these different multiverses that can kind of branch off and do different things. All the more reason we can, we can see Hugh Jackman come back again. I know Jared's excited about that. (laughs) (laughs) What did you guys think about Aunt May and about, you know, Spider-Man's ultimate decision that he had to make at the end of the film, which basically wiped all of his loved one's memory, all of his friends, loved one, everyone, the memory they had of him completely. So Aunt May, I, I never was... saw coming. I never, ever saw Aunt May dying. I had assumed they, they cast Marissa Tomei, you know, in her 40s because they were going to keep her for the next 20 years and she was going to grow into that older lady with the, the bun and, and, you know, make wheat cakes and stuff like that. So when she died, I was like, Oh, what, what, I just, I didn't know what to do with myself. Like my eyes were sweating. Jennifer is like hyperventilating beside me. I, I just never in a million years saw that, that she would be the Uncle Ben person in, in the MCU. So that just like threw me for, see, I went into this movie knowing what was going to happen. I knew what was going to happen. And none of that stuff happened in the movie. That is not how I thought anything was going to go. So I think in that regard, it was great because I was super surprised. And uh, that's the best Marvel movie is when I really don't know what's going to happen and you just enjoy it. May really got me in the feels. I had expected, see, I thought that the spell was that people that knew he was Spider-Man weren't going to know he was Spider-Man anymore. I, I guess I wasn't, my listening ears weren't on. So then when he walked into the donut shop and they didn't know him, I was like, wait, what? (laughs) <laughs> no one knows who he is. That's oh, you know, he's an, I mean, it's like if you're an 18 year old and you get dropped off and at college, I guess, and no one has any idea who you are that first day, that first week, nobody has any recollection of you. So I think that this will be great for the ramifications that can come and you're going to be able to get some more stories out of this, but it just threw me for a loop, but I thought they did it so well. They did a great job at executing it. Yeah, I think they did a really good job with the ending and him uh, making the ultimate sacrifice. He was giving up college. He was giving up his girlfriend. He was giving up the Avengers, pretty much everything. Pretty much in all of his other movies, Tom Holland, Spider-Man's been kind of playing off of with help from the Avengers, Tony Stark and all that. So it's good now he can kind of go on and make his own moves and do his own kind of thing without their help. And I thought that uh, especially... When William Defoe stabbed Toby, Tom 
was about to try to kill William Defoe. I thought that was a really good playback to when Toby killed William Defoe back in the in the first movie, you know. And uh, I thought that was really good how they how they did the whole ending right there, and especially when uh, when Andrew Garfield got a second chance at saving the girl when uh, Mary Jane fell off, and and he he yes. was able to save her this time. It was kind of like a redemption for him. Yeah, I thought that was pretty cool how yeah. that happened. Yeah, that was that was really well done. And and he saved her and he's like, You okay? And he's tearing yeah. up and she's like, Yeah, are you okay? <laughs> that was good <laughs> stuff, man. There was a lot of great moments in this film. I mean, you know, that whole end scene. I will say this, okay. This is another minor nitpick from Mr. Nitpick over here. Don't get me wrong, the movie's phenomenal. It's in my if it's not in my top 10, it's number 11. Okay. With that being said. At the end, I'm very big on stylized and uh, choreographed action sequences. And I thought there was just a little bit left to be desired there. It felt in some ways when it came to just the action and at the very end when they were fighting on the scaffolding, it felt like it wasn't, you know, as well choreographed as we've seen with movies like Civil War. There just wasn't as much cool moments in the action sequences. I mean, we got to see them swing together and, you know, do some things like that. But overall, I just thought there was a little bit left to be desired there. That's why if, if there would have been some really cool groundbreaking action sequences, it would have brought it from number 11 or 10 on my list to like number three. That's what I felt like it was missing a bit. What did you guys think? I did want to respond also to the Aunt May event before I answer the, uh, the action sequence question. I definitely think that it was like a really important anchor to the movie because it was really a lighthearted nostalgia kind of I don't want to say circle drip but it, it, it was a it was you know pretty much uh getting you right in the feels the whole time but it was all this like sort of up energy and, and it really needed some gravity to it and I think that it really turned you know this sort of lighthearted story to provide a more substantial arc and I, another thing that was really cool is the bringing back the great power comes great responsibility line. And it really, you know, this movie did something that hasn't been done in a while. We've gotten away from like morality themes in movies, but this really kind of tried to cement that in. That's something I haven't seen in a while and I did enjoy it. It didn't feel, I guess, corny as it, as it usually does, at least to me. As far as the action, I do agree that the final battle with, you know, the three Spider-Men all like, coordinating to fight the uh you know the monsters at the end was it, you know it it, it it was definitely better than venom it wasn't it wasn't venom bad but uh it, it definitely wasn't you know avengers either but I, I don't think that it fell flat and i think that this really was more of a character development movie you know it was, it was a different yeah. this was a different movie i think than the other ones in case i don't get another chance to say it i really you know, I think this is a rare movie. I think that you're not going to have like, you know, I guess Star Wars has done this, but I mean, this is a 20 year throwback to have Tobey Maguire come back and be reintroduced into this entire new universe. It, and it, it are really in like our civilization. I think it's kind of a unique experience to see that. Uh, I was talking to my you know, wife about it. Like, I, I, like I'm going to remember this movie. Like I'll remember the other Avengers and stuff, but like, the feeling of seeing Toby show up, you know, the the guy I watched as literally, you know, a kid being Spider-Man, you know, this was really the introductory to like, you know, but the Batman movies of the 90s were definitely a big deal. But like the the, the first Toby Maguire Spider-Man movies really brought in like the modern comic book movies. It was really like, you know, the next thing was Iron Man and then all the Avenger movies. So I, it, this was definitely for me close to top five, I think. So yeah, that was a lot. <laughs> yeah, that's, I, I get it. You know, like that special feeling of seeing Toby, that was up there. It was close to me, not quite, but close as big of a deal to seeing the Avengers come together for the first time. You know, it was amazing. I mean, crazy stuff. And we haven't talked about this yet, but last time I had Luke on the show, we were talking about whether or not Marvel should bring back Netflix characters well, oh boy, we have gotten them in full force in the last week. You know, we got Kingpin already on the Hawkeye show and just randomly, casually, you know, Matt Murdock was 
in this movie. I thought that was so crazy. Like he was just casually there. Like they didn't make a, that big of a deal about it. He was just his, he was going to be Spider-Man's lawyer. So I thought that was cool to see him that he's going to be in this universe. You know, I, I love him playing the role of daredevil, but so now they're acknowledging that that Netflix stuff happened in the, the current MCU universe. So are they, or is this going to be like different versions of those characters, but slightly, like slightly different, but the same, or like, because Cottonmouth is going to be the same guy that's Blade. You know, you're going to have to explain that stuff. So maybe that's what they're going to do. That's just going to be variants of Matt Murdock and Kingpin. But yeah, it was cool to see him in that film. What'd you guys think? He's a great lawyer. He said it himself. He said, I'm a great lawyer. That was great. I, I could have walked out of that theater and been happy with the first 10 minutes of the movie. Just been, been done. That was awesome. I loved it. My, <laughs> but then I think we got in our heads, at least my wife and I, because you know, we knew Kingpin was back and Daredevil's back. So then at the end, when uh, Peter Parker moves into his apartment, Jennifer's like, that's definitely Jessica Jones's apartment. That's her complex. It's like, eh think so babe i think reel it in a little bit and and we definitely don't want to see iron fist we don't want to see that come back there's a lot of stuff from the netflix shows that you know you because you, you've got like three different tiers i think of marvel shows you've got like the agents of shield then you've got the netflix shows and now you've got the disney plus shows yep and you know everybody thought agents of shield was going to be what the, Net, the the disney plus shows are and they and unfortunately it was just uh, terrible you know and then the netflix shows they have definitely big moments of greatness but there's a lot of junk in the netflix too not to so, mention the the defenders which is supposed to be their avengers was complete crap <laughs> so right. but don't get me wrong now those daredevil shows seasons one through three to me is still to this day my favorite all-time superhero tv show mm -hmm. daredevil season three definitely was good but they and were season definitely, one and two, two were great. Season two, were the punishment. They were good, definitely. They were good, but they weren't Hawkeye good. <laughs> I'll tell you that much. I think it's hey, that's the thing. Call me crazy, but I think that Daredevil seasons one, two, and three, as a whole, are better than anything Disney Plus is that we've seen on Disney Plus so far. I, I mean, with with the Netflix, I mean, and now we're talking about a whole different topic, but. But Netflix shows, there was so much, like they spent so much time on all these side characters that it really stretched the show. Like, this is a 12 hour, season one was 12 hours for Daredevil, Daredevil 1. You know, that's a lot. That's more than we've even seen Steve Rogers in the, in the movies. You know, that's a whole lot of exposition that just isn't needed. It's unnecessary. You can do other stuff with it. So to just see them condense and just take maybe the best parts of the Netflix shows, you know, he's, he's a lawyer, he wears a red costume with horns, go about your day, you know. It was kind of cool to see him talking with a Foggy, not, not a... Uh, the original that's Foggy. Like, yeah, <laughs> at the table, like, because I remember watching Ben Affleck on, on the screen and, and, oh my gosh, that's so cool, kind of a meta moment there. Yeah, by the way, guys, Happy Hogan in the MCU used to be Foggy Nelson, which is Matt Murdock's like buddy and compadre in the original Daredevil movie with uh, Ben Affleck. Just a fun fact. Criticism of the movie, even though I thought it was overall great, that I feel like should be mentioned. How about like, like literally the, the entire premise is that the dude wanted to get into college. Like this guy who literally has saved the universe, tried to rewrite like the entire cosmos so that he could be forgotten and get into MIT. I, that, that to me fell a little short. And it looks like they're gonna use that to kind of uh, jumpstart the next Doctor Strange movie. That, that kind of to me, it was a little like fell on deaf ears for me. I'm glad you brought up Doctor Strange. And I see your point, yeah. Just like some of the crap that I brought up, that's another minor complaint, you know, a nitpicky thing. But what about that post credit sequence with Doctor Strange trailer? What did you guys think about that? I, the fact that they're going to be bringing in evil Doctor Strange is so exciting to me because that's my favorite What If episode. I don't know, Grant and Luke, if you've watched What If on Disney Plus yet, but they, they give all these possible scenarios and it's basically showing us 
different, you know, multiverses and different how characters are different in these multiverses. We see an evil Doctor Strange that becomes consumed so much with trying to because his 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 uh, fiance or his girlfriend, Christine, dies in his universe. And he literally becomes consumed just trying to bring her back any way that he can. So he starts like possessing all these demons and creatures and stuff. And he becomes very, very powerful. Anyway, it's it's really exciting for me to see that in the trailer already, you know, and I know that there's going to be some bonkers stuff in that movie. So with all that being said, I guess we'll start off with Mr. Grant Watley. What do you give the film like ranking wise? Do you give it a seven? Do you give it a 9.5? Where does the movie sit for you as far as overall? Uh, I would give it a 8.5. I thought it was really, really good. Uh, I still like, say, like Avengers Endgame, you know, more, I think. Uh, but it was still up there as like a once in a lifetime, you know, definitely in my top 10 movies for sure. Uh, I like the way I like the uh, Toby. I liked uh, Andrew and I liked Tom. I thought Tom did a really good job and especially, especially in the hard scenes where, you know, May died and uh, he really had to convey a lot of emotion. I thought it really did a really good job and actually showing what he was feeling in that moment. Yeah. Tom Holland knocked it out of the park for sure. Yeah. Mr. Vineyard, what do you think? I, I give it, I actually give this a 10. I really, uh, I really enjoyed this movie. Like I said, it, it definitely pulled my, my childhood strings. To me, Tobey Maguire will always be uh, Spider-Man. I, I like Tom Holland. I feel like he's true to Peter Parker. Andrew Garfield, I always felt like he was way too cool to be Spider-Man. Like, he, like I, I feel like he's like going to pick on the nerds at school. And uh, that's just literally who Peter Parker was. So for me, it was really cool to see Tom, uh, Tom Holland and Tobey Maguire, like kind of like a passing of the torch almost. Uh, I, I thought that was really cool. This movie connected a lot of elements. It, it had some seriousness, you know, to a really slapstick, mostly trend that has been going on with these Spider-Man movies. There, there were a couple elements that I was kind of shocked that had a lot of potential that they didn't develop. Like, you know, the moment where, Toby Maguire was like empathizing with him that he lost Aunt May. I felt like that was a little, a little um, weaker than it could have been just because it, you know, that's, that's a pretty serious subject. Uh, you know, he lost his uncle Ben and Aunt May and they, they kind of glossed over that pretty quickly. But other than that though, the, the, the overall movie was definitely, uh, I, I'll probably watch it again and I don't watch too many movies more than once. What about you, Jared? What do you think? I know you're excited to see it. Yeah. I'd probably give it a nine to a 9.5. Uh, not quite 10, but it's so close. It's just on the cusp. And I just wanted to say the word cusp really is why I said that. But it was so good, man. It was just fun. Like you just went to the movie theater and you had a good time. It was, You laughed. You cried. It, it, was, it was all the things for me. And I got to say to Luke's point about how, you know, oh, my gosh, you know, basically this what he did all this because he wanted to get in college. And I think it had to be. That kind of situation for May's with great power comes great responsibility line to actually work. Otherwise, it wouldn't have worked like for, for him to kind of put it all together. And I think that was just so important that what he did was what some stupid 17 or 18 year old would do, would to be like, oh, I want my girlfriend who, you know, in real life, when you're 17, you're never going to see this girl again after you graduate high school, but she's the, she's your everything. I really want her to be getting to school so we can go to school together. So totally, you know, warp the world. I'm in, you know, and May was like, bruh, with great power comes great responsibility. So for me, that, that kind of really put it all together. But like Dr. Strange, freaking all he's seeing he's like yeah well this makes sense and just start <laughs> pulling the glue out of the freaking uh atoms i mean i, I don't know that, i thought that was i it, i get your point though i agree one well, and that's why think, wong, that's why wong is sorcerer supreme and not dr strange <laughs> do you guys think that uh say five six years down the road that you'll still rate it at what you rated it at today because i think that i probably I've rated mine at 8.5 simply because down the road when it's not a surprise that Toby and Andrew's going to be on there anymore as an overall movie, I pretty much, I probably would have gave it a nine, but I deducted half a point because that's no longer going to play a factor in an overall movie down the road. Yeah. That's part I, of it. I, though. 
I feel like that's part of the movie experience, right? Like you can't, like your first viewing of it is, is the most important experience, right? Like, I, I don't know. That's, that's kind of like yeah, saying, yeah. you know, that you don't like a joke because now you know the punchline. Like it's, it's different. Yeah. Like it, it's very important that you didn't know anyway, but yeah. I, to your point, to your point, it may not be as timeless as I feel right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I I'm, I'm like that with a lot of comic book movies, you know, one particular example is the justice league film. When the first Justice League came out, I had it ranked somewhere in the neighborhood of a 7.5, 7. But now it's definitely to me like a 6 or a 5.5, you know, just because it was cool to see a, a big a big team up with the DC characters that Jared loves and adores so much. But I'll say I agree with Grant. I think that it's roughly about an 8.5. Uh, like I said earlier, if the action sequences and co fight choreography would have been a little – uh, more up to par with what we've seen from the MCU, then I would have given it a nine, 9.5. For me, it falls just short of my top 10. It, I know I'm a super nerd for keeping a list on my phone of my top superhero movies, all of them ranked in order from like one all the way to 80 something. But I couldn't quite put it above Thor Ragnarok, which is my number 10. So uh, for me, Thor Ragnarok is slightly better than right underneath it is Spider-Man Far From Home or No Way Home. So that's my thoughts on it. Jared, would you like to plug the M6P? Yeah, check us out on all the uh, social media forums, the M6P.com. And the website would be the M6P.com, yes. <laughs> Heck yeah. Guys, thank you for joining me. It's been a pleasure. If you haven't already, make sure you like, share, and subscribe. Uh, you can check us out on Facebook and on Instagram. We're at Real Comic Book Cinema. Until next time, everyone, have a wonderful day.